Six months of a war experts predicted would be over in days. How does Ukraine keep pushing back against invading Russian forces? Russia's seizure of a Ukrainian atomic power plant has all of Europe on edge. Plus, going back to school during wartime. Now, on the Inside Story, Flashpoint Ukraine. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA Senior Washington Correspondent. Nowhere has conventional wisdom been challenged more than in Ukraine. When Russia began its attack on February 24th, experts predicted Kyiv would fall within days. Now, more than six months later, Ukraine says it is pushing back Russian forces in a series of defeats and retreats in eastern Ukraine, the territory closest to Russia's border. More on Ukraine's advances and U.S. support from VOA senior diplomatic correspondent Cindy Sain. Ukraine says its forces have retaken towns and villages around the strategic hub of Izium as part of a major counteroffensive against Russia in the country's east. Experts say they are stunned by Ukraine's surprise gains and Russia's rapid retreat. It seems to be just a complete failure of logistics, strategy, tactics on the Russian side. Uh, everything is just falling apart. Their lines are collapsing. Uh, troops are leaving, running behind and leaving all of their ammunition, leaving vehicles, leaving weapons. Uh, th that's just astonishing to me that it's such a disorganized kind of retreat. The past few days have taken a toll on Russian soldiers' morale. But you see aspects of the Russians melting down in places. And that type of thing is infectious in a negative, negative way when the troops lose their will to fight. And that appears to be happening. No matter what the orders are from above, um, the, uh, things get really bad. And that's what we're hearing, certainly around Kherson um, and uh, up near Kharkiv. So these advancements are huge. Uh, they come at a time when we're starting to have another debate in the West about providing more assistance and more military aid. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Kyiv earlier in September, promising another $2.8 billion in American support to Ukraine and its neighbors. Mr. President, uh, we know this is a pivotal moment. Um, more than six months into Russia's war of aggression uh, against Ukraine as your counteroffensive is now underway and proving effective. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky praised the bravery of Ukrainian troops and condemned Russia for striking back at civilian infrastructure and causing widespread blackouts in the Kharkiv and Donetsk regions. And I think that Russia's targeting of, these, of the civilian infrastructure, of the electrical power plants and water plants, is a sign of desperation. When you know you're losing on the battlefield, this is what you do. No reasonable uh, a, a military commander would suggest that we should use $30 million worth of ballistic missiles to take Ukraine's electric grid off for a couple of hours. But this is exactly what we're seeing. There has not been much official Russian reaction yet to the Ukrainian advances, but on Sunday, a military map presented by the Russian Defense Ministry showed that its forces have made a major withdrawal from the Kharkiv region. Cindy Sain, VOA News, the State Department. Ukraine's advances are not limited to the Kharkiv region. There is another front in the southern region of Kherson, which has a large concentration of Russian troops. The goal is to retake the port city of Mariupol, and the city of Zaporizhia, where Russian forces are in control of a nuclear power plant in the war's crosshairs. The UN is calling for a safe zone around the plant. Ukraine says the inspector's report does not go far enough. More from our Henry Ridgewell. Ina Holikova is preparing for a nuclear disaster. She's collecting medicines for herself and her two-year-old son, Alexander to counter any radiation leak from the nearby Zaporizhia nuclear plant. 
Мы пришли получить таблеточку. I came here to get the iodine potassium pills, so if there is a catastrophe, we will be able to take it and save our lives. I hope we won't need it. IAEA inspectors reported extensive damage to the plant, including to a building that houses fresh nuclear fuel and radioactive waste. The inspectors were forced to take cover from nearby shelling during their visit. We are playing with fire and something very, very catastrophic could take place. The UN's secretary general called for a protection zone around the site. That would include a commitment by Russian forces to withdraw all military personnel and equipment from that perimeter and the commitment by Ukrainian forces not to move into it. IAEA inspectors witnessed Russian military personnel and equipment at the site, including military trucks stationed in two turbine halls. Ukraine says Russia is shelling the area as part of a false flag operation. I believe that the world not only deserves, but also needs the representatives of the IAEA to force Russia to demilitarize the territory of the plant and return full control to Ukraine. Russia denied military equipment is stored there and blamed Ukraine for the attacks. <laughs> We're shooting it ourselves, are we? It is utter nonsense. There is no other way to describe it. The six nuclear reactors at the site are well protected, but not indestructible. They have very thick uh, concrete containments that are meters thick of concrete, and then inside of that, Inside of each building, you have a reactor with a pressure vessel that is almost a foot thick of steel. The main grid power lines to the site are damaged. Its cooling systems are currently powered by a backup line from the plant's generator itself. Diesel generators are a last resort. To bring such an amount of diesel to the station through the front line is very difficult at the moment. A total loss of power would force a shutdown of the reactor cooling system. In that case, the reactor's fuel can overheat and you are potentially then going into a meltdown type scenario. Ukraine's government says it is exploring whether the plant can be shut down. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Russia's defense ministry acknowledges the retreating from areas around Kharkiv, saying they are regrouping forces in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region to liberate those territories they say are controlled by Russian-backed separatists. But the battlefield losses are exposing some cracks in the Kremlin. Dozens of municipal deputies from councils in Moscow and St. Petersburg signed a petition calling for President Vladimir Putin to resign over what Russia's propaganda machine still calls a, quote, special military operation. VOA's Polygraph team looks at what's projected to the Russian people in this fact check. On August 30th, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov described Russia's six-month-old war against Ukraine as proceeding right on track. The special military operation continues. It continues methodically. It continues in accordance with the existing plans. All goals will be achieved. That is misleading. Russia failed to capture Kiev as planned, has suffered massive losses, and is running short of tanks, troops, and high-end munitions. Captured Russian documents show that the Kremlin aimed to conquer Ukraine in 15 days. Russian troops intended to seize Kiev in three or four days, then remove President Volodymyr Zelensky. That never happened. When Ukraine fought back with Western tank-killing weapons, Russia had to pull out from around Kiev. Estimates of Russian losses vary, but are all high. In June, British intelligence estimated 20,000 Russian troops had died. The Pentagon estimates up to 80,000 have been killed and wounded. Now, the Kremlin is recruiting convicted criminals, promising them generous payments and amnesty if they survive. According to the U.S. Defense Department, Russia has lost almost 1,000 tanks, nearly a third of its inventory. Russia was forced to dust off all T-62 tanks developed in the 1950s. Russia is running low on precision-guided weapons. Under Western sanctions, it will have a hard time replacing them. 
Beyond the fighting on the battlefield, the war has placed a stranglehold on Ukraine's economy, which the World Bank says will shrink by an estimated 45 percent this year. The bleak outlook has businesses searching for ways to maintain and survive. VOA's Licia Bakaletz has the story. In Ukraine, the war is taking place not only on the front lines, but also in the economic sphere, where businesses are fighting to survive. After Russia invaded Ukraine, the non-profit group Spend with Ukraine was created to promote Ukrainian goods and services around the world. We focus on companies that create goods and services for individual consumers. So you won't find any agricultural companies on our website or metal equipment producers. But you will find companies that make electronic devices or vehicles. Andy Hunder, president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine, says local businesses have demonstrated they can survive even during a war. Ukrainians have demonstrated resilience, and the world has noticed. The banking system operates, the internet operates in war-stricken Kyiv better than in some peaceful European cities. Mobile connections work, elevator companies work. At the moment, over 190 Ukrainian companies are represented on the nonprofit's website. There are tech companies like Clean My Mac. In the education category, there are apps by Ukrainian developers that help with learning foreign languages. Preply is one of the most popular. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of students that use our platform to learn a foreign language. Another globally known company is ReSpeecher. Its focus is synthesized sound. We've created technology that allows a person to speak with a different person's voice, a totally different voice. In The Mandalorian, we did Luke Skywalker's voice. Company representatives say Spend with Ukraine is bringing them new clients. A Ukrainian national clothing brand, Etnadim, has noticed a similar effect. With the start of the war after Spend with Ukraine was created, we were among the first brands to be represented there. Our web traffic has risen dramatically. We got new customers. Ukraine's president Vladimir Zelensky wore one of the Vishivankas made by Etnadim. Since then, demand has grown so much the company can't make them fast enough. Hunter says U.S. companies should prepare to invest in Ukrainian businesses. We say, look what Ukrainians are doing, what resilience they're demonstrating during a war. Just imagine what doing business with Ukrainians would be like when the war is over. Spend with Ukraine hopes to join with more international partners to promote Ukrainian goods around the world. For Lesya Bakalets in Washington, Anna Rice, VOA News. One constant for businesses and governments, there is little they can do when it comes to immediate sources of fuel. Now, Russia has already cut its gas pipeline to Germany, as Western allies accuse Russia's president of weaponizing energy, going so far as to destroy some of its own gas supplies, endangering the environment. We go back to our Henry Ridgewell. Close to the Finnish border, Russia is burning off huge amounts of gas. Although flaring is common in the industry, Russia has been destroying an estimated $10 million worth of gas every day for two months as Europe suffers from shortages. Experts describe it as an environmental disaster. Due to the war in Ukraine, there is very little information about what is actually happening there. So we can only speculate that right now there is some technical difficulties. The location is Portavia in Russia, the site of the compressor station for the Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline that runs under the Baltic Sea to Germany. Russia's state-owned Gazprom has not commented on the flare. European gas prices have soared to around 10 times their average price over the past decade. Germany declared a gas crisis in June and warned that consumers and businesses must cut back. Consumption has fallen by around 20 percent. In a stark speech, French President Emmanuel Macron warned of the end of abundance. Our freedom, the system of freedom which we are used to living in, has a cost. 
Russia supplied the European Union with 40% of its gas last year. As the Kremlin turns off the taps, Europe is scrambling to find alternative sources. Imports of liquefied natural gas, or LNG, including from the United States, have helped fill gas storage sites to 80% capacity, two months ahead of the EU target. That has calmed markets. Storage by itself isn't enough for the winter. With all the pipelines cut off, which is what we have to expect from Russia, that all their pipelines will be cut off, all the LNG we can take, you know, that storage is going to last two and a half months in heating season. And then, you know, Europe's stuck. Europe is trying to wean itself off Putin's gas, but analysts say it will take at least two years. In the meantime, he has leverage and he will use it all he can before he totally loses the business. The dependence of Europe on Russian delivered gas by pipeline is much greater than, the, let's say, the importance of that money for Putin because he makes so much more money from oil. Across Europe, new LNG terminals are under construction. Old coal and nuclear power plants are being fired up again. There is big investment in renewable power. But short term, it may not be enough, and governments are warning of a difficult winter ahead. Henry Ridgewell for VUA News, London. Just like most countries in the Northern Hemisphere, September means back to school for students in Ukraine. And months of war means discovering creative ways to continue the learning process for millions of school children. More from Licia Bakaletz. Ukraine's Ministry of Education and Science says Russian forces have shelled or bombed some 2,300 educational institutions since the war began. 286 have been destroyed. But that hasn't stopped school from starting this year. I'm starting my fourth year. Nine-year-old Alena Savina is a Kiev native. She loves music and English lessons and likes to paint. She also knows when it's time to hide in a bomb shelter. When I hear the siren. Alena's mother, Yulia Savina, says her daughter really wanted to be in the classroom, so they found a school with a safe shelter. Our school is small, just two classes. The bomb shelter has recently been renovated. It's large, has very thick walls. It was just repainted for the children. Plumbing fixtures and bathroom accessories have all been redone. Alena also has a special emergency backpack. Ukrainian police recommend all children carry one. There is a jacket, water, some snacks. Her grandma gave her extra if she wants to share with friends. There is also a special badge. I haven't signed it yet. We need to put the parents' names and phone number. Since July, all educational institutions have undergone safety audits. Only schools with updated bomb shelters can have students in class. And the number of children in school depends on the size of the school's shelter. We have confirmed that 41% of schools in the country are ready and have proper shelters. Teachers have the means to keep the children who will attend school in person safe. This school in Irpin, just outside of Kiev, has 2,000 students, but the bomb shelter can only hold 300. We are currently figuring out how exactly we are going to work. The majority of kids, the oldest, will study online. For now we are trying in-person and hybrid education for younger children. Maybe we will have two shifts, maybe three. Kiev native Oksana Kostyushka says her younger son is going with a hybrid schedule. My youngest will have a week in person, followed by a week of online education. It's a tough choice. According to a survey by the educational ombudsman Sergei Gorbachev, over 60% of parents still living in Ukraine have picked online learning for their children. Another 20% are still debating what's best for their kids. For Lesya Bakalets in Washington, Anna Rice, VOA News. Before we go, a few minutes to remember Britain's Queen Elizabeth II and the profound impact she made on our world. 
during her remarkable 70-year reign. From London, here's VOA's Europe correspondent, Henry Ridgewell. She was the only monarch many of the British alive today have ever known, a symbol of her nation, its empire and its commonwealth. She personified British strength and character, long before she even knew she would be queen. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. At 25, Elizabeth ascended to the throne after the death of her father, George VI, nearly five years after she had married the Greek-born Prince Philip. She saw a thorough transformation of society and technology during her reign of more than seven decades, a time in which she warned about the dangers of throwing away ageless ideals while embracing the advantages of new inventions. She sent out her first tweet in 2014. There are few records she did not break. She was Britain's most travelled, oldest, longest reigning monarch. As head of the Commonwealth, the Queen has links with the past. Sometimes it's a past that's difficult to come to terms with because you think of empire, you think of colonial exploitation, for example. But so far as the Queen is concerned, you think of her dedication to the organisation. She represented Britain in friendships with those who held in common the British values of freedom, equality and democracy. With dignity, she faced those who did not. Being seen with her was a means of gaining the appearance of prestige. The Queen was not immune to criticism in her own country. The left targeted her as a symbol of an institution out of place in a postmodern, neoliberal and democratic world and a burden on the British taxpayer. The death of the popular Princess Diana was an opportunity for her critics who accused her of being coldly slow to react. What I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. The marriage of her grandson, Prince William, to Kate Middleton brought youthful glamour to the ancient institution. When Prince Harry married American actor Meghan Markle, Elizabeth was at the head of a family that appeared to be moving with the times, popular, diverse and global. But there were painful times ahead. Her second son, Prince Andrew, was investigated for links to a convicted child sex offender. Harry and Meghan fell out with the royal family amid accusations of racism. The passing of Elizabeth's husband, Prince Philip, in 2021 left an enduring image. A queen mourning alone as the coronavirus pandemic swept across her nation. In September, she appointed the 15th Prime Minister of her reign, her last major public engagement. Queen Elizabeth remains a giant in the history of one of the planet's great nations, a bridge between Britain's colonial past and its future as a global player in a world vastly different from the one she was born in. Visiting Germany in 2015, she spoke of the vast changes she had witnessed. In our lives, Mr. President, we have seen the worst, but also the best of our continent. We have witnessed how quickly things can change for the better. But we know that we must work hard to maintain the benefits of the post-war world. Britain's royal tradition, of which Elizabeth was a steward, is now in the hands of her heirs. The Britain they inherit is a drastically different one in terms of demographics, culture and economics. In a globalised, pluralistic world, their job of projecting an image of greatness is no less complicated. Henry Ridgewell for VUA News, London. Seven decades on the throne, and she tweeted, and had a platinum jubilee. Well, that's all for now. Stay up to date on what's going on in Ukraine at voanews.com. Follow VOA News on Instagram and Facebook, and check out previous episodes on VOA+. And you can follow me on Twitter, at Carolyn VOA. For all of those behind the scenes who brought you this show, I'm Carolyn Persuti. 
See you next week for the Inside Story.